the surgeon came on the line and then I, my dad was like, I just saw his face drop. And then that was when they were like, oh, you know, your daughter has Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that kind of started the thing. And so I looked at my dad and I was like, what's happening? And he was like, you have cancer. And I was just like, what? Yeah, I just kind of think that, um, at least at that time, I kind of feel like doctors did what they were supposed to do, right? They cured my cancer. And, but they didn't really tell me, like, what, what's life after that, you know? Um, what are the things you might have to deal with later? I am 39 years old and uh, I currently work in strategy and business development as a profession and I have um, two children and a husband. I grew up in western North Carolina. Um, I stayed in North Carolina. Um, I live here now still and um, as far as hobbies go I like to um, be outdoors. I play with my kids and um, and just generally uh, like to to hang out with with my family. You're a family person, I, I can tell. And, <laughs> and there's a lot we're gonna talk about in terms of your family and building that family. So let's let's dive right into this conversation. I know that the very first time you started to feel something was wrong was a while ago, it was 20 years ago now. So you're 19. Can you just briefly describe what were the first things that you felt that made you realize something wasn't right? Um, yeah, so it kind of started probably back when I was kind of ending high school and then kind of the summer after that. Um, I was having a lot of interesting symptoms in terms of like kind of some itching and like my uh, menstrual cycles were not um, regular. And so, um, I told my mom and she started to kind of look into, um, different doctors that I could go see. And then, um, that kind of progressed into a little bit more intense itching. And then I started to have trouble sleeping. And that was kind of after I had already started college kind of into, um, my sophomore year. Uh, that's when kind of the intense symptoms started to happen. I mean, and, and being so young, obviously cancer is not the top thing for anybody to think about, including doctors whom you're seeing. And, and like many people, you kind of went and addressed each one of these symptoms individually. So you had this, itching, right. you went to a dermatologist and then an allergy specialist. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, a, I went to the dermatologist first because it was itching and it kind of just seemed like a logical thing to do. Um, and then, uh, then I started to feel like, well, maybe I'm allergic to something. And so my PCP sent me to an allergist and um, they tested me for a lot of things and decided that I was allergic to a couple of different things. So started um, giving me allergy shots for that. And so, and then I kind of just kept seeing like individual specialists for the individual things. Uh, you ended up going to an ENT or ear, nose, throat specialist. And really by that time, it had already been about a year. So you yes. first started to feel it almost a year ago. Um, first, if you're to think back, is it just sort of like it's easy to explain away these symptoms? Like what was going through your head at the time? Um, I think like I knew something was wrong because I just didn't feel quite right. Um, but I had started college and so things had changed from a lifestyle perspective. Maybe I wasn't eating as well. I wasn't exercising as much. Um, and, or maybe I was stressed out. And so I kind of just thought, well, maybe it's just the new normal. Um, but then I think I would go to the doctor and just feel like some, it's still not fixed. Right. And so um, I think it was just kind of, my mom really just kept taking me to doctors to try to figure it out because she kind of 
saw that I was, you know, was just not myself during that whole year that we were kind of seeing specialists. So you finally going to this ENT specialist, the PA or a physician assistant is the one who ended up finding a large lymph node or multiple and ordered a biopsy. Um, looking back, do you know if you had the enlarged nodes for a while and just no one noticed or? Well, so what was interesting is like, I came home from school, like one break, um, it was, you know, during my freshman year. And my dad was like, why is your neck so big? And, and I don't think anybody thought lymph nodes because he was just like, what are you doing? You know, I think you kind of just think college, so she must be getting into stuff she's not supposed to be getting into. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of where it, it left off. Um, and, and so, uh, but like, I didn't think of it then. It's just kind of like all hindsight. So I went to the ENT in Claremont, North Carolina, where I grew up. And um, I think my parents specifically said, can we get a surgeon in Chapel Hill? Because that's where I was going to school. And I think it took a little bit to kind of make that all happen. Yeah. Part of that is interesting too. Did you know at that point yet that there was the thought of possible cancer or was it just like, ah, oh, something's not right and we need more tests? Yeah, no, that hadn't even crossed my mind actually. Yeah. I thought maybe I just had like mono or something and or some sort of infection that just had gone crazy. Right, right. And so at what point, so you go into the actual appointment, they do, this was a lymph node uh, biopsy. So it was excisional. They actually went under, they took something out or was it a- Yeah, um, so I can't remember exactly, but I know it was outpatient. And so I went in and it was just at the surgeon's office. Like I didn't go to the hospital or anything. And I think it was, um, I, I think- I don't think there was like a complete incision. I think he just kind of inserted something in there. So that happened. And then you're waiting for the results. Can you recount? I know this is many years ago, but can you recount how you learned that there was something serious going on? Yeah. So that was kind of weird. Um, so a week had gone by and I was just like, yeah, I haven't heard from the doctor. My parents were constantly asking me. And then finally, my dad was like, well, we're coming up and we're going to figure out what the answer is. So they came up to Chapel Hill and um, called the doctor's office or the surgeon's office. And my dad was on the phone, actually. I didn't call them. And, um, and me and my mom were sitting there with him. And the receptionist was like, well, he's in with the patient, but I can, I can get a hold of him for you. You just stay on the line. And so I think that would have been a red flag because like usually they don't drop everything. <laughs> um, and so then the surgeon came on the line and then I, my dad was like, I just saw his face drop. And then that was when they were like, oh, you know, your daughter has Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that kind of started the thing. And so I looked at my dad and I was like, what's happening? And he was like, you have cancer. And I was just like, what? <laughs> um, so it was just kind of weird because I didn't actually get it from the surgeon. It was kind of like relayed from my dad, which probably was good now that I think about it. Cause like both my parents were there at the same time. Yeah. What was that like hearing that is your dad kind of more stoic or is he more emotional or, you know? How oh, yeah. He's stoic. I like, I think it was just kind of like, it's almost as if too, it was a relief. Cause I was like, finally, like, I know what's going on. Um, but also kind of, a little, you know, scared obviously, cause I wasn't white. Um, you know, I didn't quite understand what it meant. Um, and so it was just like a little uncertainty and nervousness about it. And you're so young. And so your parents, it sounds like really drove a lot of this process to get the diagnosis going. I mean, your parents were like, we're just going to come up and call the surgeon's office. So what happened in terms of figuring out treatment? I know you started that month on ABVD. Um, and yeah, what was that like? Just sort of transitioning into treatment and did you just how did you choose where to go um so choosing where to go was pretty easy because I was on campus already at UNC and they have a UNC cancer hospital there and so the surgeon was like I'll just refer you to UNC if that's okay and I said sure um so that process went pretty quickly I got in to see them um within like a week or two and um and at that point, it was just kind of talking about like what the next few months were going to entail. 
So um, I kind of just decided to stay there because uh, they, they're on campus so I could walk to treatment basically. And, um, and then it just made it easier because I had everything I pretty much needed to reduce my course load. I had ABVD and I think it was every other Friday. So, um, so every other Friday, my parents would come up and I would meet yeah. them at my class. They would pick me up and take me to um, outpatient chemotherapy place. <laughs> and then, um, and then they would take me home for the weekend. So my major, um, my major symptom was actually um, nausea and vomiting. And I would actually start vomiting before I even got treatment because I was just so like nervous. I think they called it like anticipatory nausea. Um, so I would sit in my biology class and, um, and I would just start getting sick <laughs> without any treatment. <laughs> And so that was kind of the, uh, the, the main symptom. Um, I did have some hair loss, but it was, it, it was weird. It was like, I got my hair cut really, really short. So it looked like I just had a really short haircut. Like it was falling out, but at any given point, I don't think I went entirely bald. Um, and only the, uh, the nausea and vomiting and the, just the general overall ickiness that I felt that was my main, my main symptom of that. What was that like being 19 and having to reconfigure your college life to this? Um, like looking back, I think it, it was probably the best thing I could have done because it kind of gave me normalcy. I think if I moved back home and just kind of stopped everything, I would have been unhappy, but like having my friends around and like a normal college life was actually helpful. Now my GPA probably wouldn't say the same thing, but, <laughs> but as a person, like it helped, I think to be on campus and to kind of have that, um, just normal, uh, like normal life, like, um, because I didn't really want to stop everything all at once. Yeah. And I actually met someone who had um, Hodgkin's in undergrad. He was in law school at the time. Like the doctors put me in contact with him and he was like, you know, it kind of seems daunting, but he was like, I think with the reduced course load, you might be okay. Cause he had done the same thing. And um, so I was able to take it, my course load down to less than half um, and still be considered a full-time student. And so uh, I kind of just took his, his advice and was like, okay, I think I can do this. Yeah. And he was really helpful during that whole time. It's great that your doctor put you in touch with someone. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, but for other people out there diagnosed young, like, was there anything else that was helpful overall processing the diagnosis or trying to figure out how to move forward being so young and then being faced with cancer? Um, no, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I took it in stride. I just kind of felt like I didn't really have a choice. And so it was just kind of, uh, like I just had to do it. And I felt kind of felt like it was probably the best case scenario for me. And that I was at a campus that had a really great cancer hospital. So I was, you know, it almost kind of felt like it fell into place a little bit. Um, so it kind of helped kind of drive my decision-making. When you noticed other peers on campus living like, you know, normal lives, how did it impact you? Like, how were you emotionally, mentally dealing with it? Um, I think, I think I just found my people, right? And so like, I had some really great friends who were willing to kind of change their lifestyle for me. So they knew that I couldn't go out and have fun on, you know, most nights after treatments or when I got back. And so like, sometimes when I got, my parents would drop me off after a treatment, like I would go home with them on Friday and then they would drop me back off like Monday morning, Monday evening, my friends were like, you know, they would come over with like um, takeout and they would just like watch a movie with me. Um, I think it was just really having a support system that helped and like allowing my friends to just be 
So like sometimes they would come and just sit with me during treatments. Like my parents were there and, and they were there, but just knowing that they're there, it was kind of nice. Um, and, and not trying to push people away. Cause I kind of felt like, well, I can't really make friends now because I've got all this stuff going on, but like not letting your mind go there. Like your friends want to help you and they want to be with you. And it may not be ideal, but, um, they're, they're willing to kind of put the effort into helping you too. And, um, it was just kind of cool. Cause like, um, like UNC is a really big kind of sports school. Right. But if I was like, you know, like platelets were low or white blood cells were low, they're like, Amanda well, can't go. Right. <laughs> so, and so they were like, let's just do something else. Um, and so they were really good about including me in things that they knew that I could go to that were healthy and I was, wasn't going to get sick and things like that. Um, and then related to that, um, in terms of treatment, that wasn't the end of it. I mean, basically from your entire school year, you then from chemo went into radiation and right. that was for a couple of months. Um, could you describe, I mean, was there anything about radiation in terms of side effects or anything that you'd like to share in terms of guidance for others? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think in terms of radiation, I just had a really, really sore throat. Um, and the funny thing about it, and I don't even know if I should mention this, but I actually ended radiation about a week before the last day of classes. And I thought it would be cool to take a shot of something, right. To commemorate the end. And that was like the worst thing I could have ever done. Cause it just like burned <laughs> my throat down. And so I went to my radiation oncologist and I was like, like, I am sorry, I can't do that. And he was just like laughing. He was like, I've seen it before, right? <laughs> He's like, there's a lot of college students that have come through here who've had cancer and radiation. He was like, I understand. And he was like, here's this stuff. So he gave me like this liquid stuff. And then he was like, take it like a shot. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. I deserve it, right? <laughs> and so then I was like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> Eventually, like a month later, I had no problems. Um, I would say that like after that, my radiation oncologist was really adamant about testing me for um, hypothyroidism. So he was constantly checking my thyroid and that ended up being like a long-term side effect of the radiation treatment. That And that has a whole nother, of course, impact to life. Um, could you sum up what that meant for you? Um, yeah, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I think it was just kind of understanding that for, for the rest of my life, I have to be tested for this, make sure my blood work is okay. Um, but other than that, it was just kind of trying to find the right dosage and then um, just sticking with a plan of how do you make sure that you're getting the right dosage over time. And um, they kind of walked me through that. And then my primary care physician was kind of brought on board. He understood what was going on. And, and now it's just kind of a routine thing where every, you know, every couple times a year, I just go and make sure my thyroid levels are correct. And then they either up the medication or whatever to, to keep it um, stable. In hindsight now, looking at that time, is there anything that you would have done differently or asked more questions about? Yeah, I think I would have, I probably, I wish I would have asked about fertility, honestly, because I guess I had just read everything about Hodgkin's lymphoma and how um, usually it's cured and you never really have to deal with it again. And, um, and so I wish I would have asked about it because there was like a span of eight years between like my first diagnosis and then it coming back that I could have done something. I could have frozen my eggs or I could have, you know, um, prepared for what's next, even if I wouldn't have needed it, it would have been nice to have had that opportunity to know that, that there is a chance that this could happen. Um, but it's not really part of the treatment plan, um, going forward. And so I just never really thought about it. I kind of wish I would have. And so now when I talk to other people or other, um, 19, 20 year olds at that time, frame, you know, that are going through this, I'm always like, you think you don't need it and you may never need it. Right. But just be sure that you ask, um, about infertility and if there's options for freezing your eggs. 
Is there any other thing in terms of just highlighting why that's so important? Um, mentally and emotionally, there's so many things that we're distracted by as patients. You were able to get through treatment. You were no evidence of disease after, which was great. But then there was this time period where you wish you could have prepared for it differently. So what, what are those feelings when you think about that sort of like maybe not missed opportunity, but missed like option in that right. time? Yeah, I just kind of think that um, at least at that time, I kind of feel like doctors did what they were supposed to do, right? They cured my cancer and, but they didn't really tell me like what, what's life after that, you know, um, what are the things you might have to deal with later? And, and, and it's not just infertility. I mean, I had hypothyroidism, which they kind of told me a little bit about, but then you have potential for heart problems, potential for lung problems. Um, there was like, I think a blood clot that I had, um, that ended up showing it's had like 20 years later, like in terms of, um, a lot of things that I had to go through during my pregnancies. It's just, it's like, yeah, the cancer's gone, but then you like, you cause all this other damage in the process, um, that I wasn't really privy to until you, you kind of, go through all of your health history and, you know, doctors are like, oh, okay, well that could be a problem. And then, um, and so then you have to deal with it over and over again. So it's kind of, it's kind of like, I'm a cancer survivor, but, um, I'm still dealing with a lot of other things because of that. As we shift into it, Amanda, you had, you ended treatment, it was 2003 Mm -hmm. And then it was 2010 when you started to feel things again. And this time you said you just knew something was wrong again. Right. Yeah. I just knew I like, I, I just didn't feel right. And I didn't even bother going to like my primary care physician. I just kind of knew. And then I, I tried to kind of shove a lot of things into a couple of months that I know I really wanted to do. And then I was like, okay, now I'm ready to go tell somebody that this is back. And that's kind of the how that started in 2010. Interesting. When you say you tried to shovel in a couple of things for two months, can you describe that? Yeah. Yeah. So I had, I met my boyfriend, who's now my husband back in like 2006. So I had given him kind of an overview of like what I had gone through in like 2002 and 2003. Um, and so he was kind of, he understood what was going on because he knew that I was getting like scans and stuff um, still for that. And then um, in 2009, I started grad school. And, um, and so I, you know, was kind of in the back of my head, like thinking, you know, I really want to get through grad school and I want to marry this guy and I want to start my life. And so, um, so when 2010 rolled around and I kind of started feeling a little off, I was like, uh oh, like, you know, maybe this isn't the plan anymore. And so, um, we had, I, I scheduled kind of a vacation for the summer in between my 2009, 2010 grad school year. Um, and then there were like a couple of steakhouses I wanted to eat at. Cause once you're on chemo, you don't like to eat. So then I went and ate at some of my favorite places. And then, um, finally I was like telling my, my parents and my boyfriend, I think I'm going to go to the doctor. Cause I don't think I think something's up. And so then that's when they were like, uh, you know, <laughs> cause they knew that if I were saying something that I probably felt it. Can you describe, well, if you knew something was wrong, that it was probably cancer, like, why wouldn't you want to take care of it right away? But there's something here about living life, right? Right. Yeah. I think it was just kind of like, you know, um, how much more worse can it get in two months? <laughs> Uh, and so it's like, cause I went a whole year without treating it last time. And so if I spend the next two months, just trying to get things, you know, kind of settled, then, um, then I kind of just felt like I could do it. You know, I kind of knew what, it, I kind of knew that it was going to take over my life for a while. And I just wanted to make sure that, um, I had some nice memories to fall back on once it started doing that. Wow. Interesting. So were you 
the feelings were, okay, I'm just going to compartmentalize this a little bit. I can hold on. Two months is, is fine. When you said I wanted to have memories to hold on to, were you nervous that you might not be able to, like, was there a worry that you wouldn't be able to enjoy? Yeah, there was worry I wouldn't be able to enjoy. And I think there was worry that like, like my boyfriend would probably not want to stick around, um, which wasn't the case, by the way, but it was kind of in the back of my head, like, you know, this is just going to wreck my life. And so um, let's just savor it for the last few months and then deal with it as it comes. What other thoughts did you have? Um, and do you have any sort of guidance for other people? There's plenty of people out there who are young and in different ages and worried about how cancer is going to impact their relationships, including romantic ones. Right. Yeah. I like, I don't, I don't know. I just kind of felt like after the first diagnosis, I was pretty open to people about it because it was like a, a huge part of me that I felt like anybody that I was romantically um, involved with should know. And, um, and just kind of could tell, you know, if it was gonna be a problem or not a problem. And a lot of my friends already knew because I was still, you know, talking with the same friends. And um, the new friends that I had made maybe weren't really privy to it, but I felt like they were really um, just supportive, good people. So I, I didn't worry too much about it. Um, I honestly don't know how, how like you would bring it up to people who don't know um, because it's kind of like, there's a certain part of your life where it, you just think you're never going to get it again. So why bother telling people about it? Um, I think it's just a select few where you're like, maybe this person should know. And I kind of just kind of felt that way, at least with my boyfriend, because I kind of felt like we had been dating for a long time and there was something there and I should probably make sure that he knew a lot about my health history and stuff like that. <laughs> 